Hi, and welcome to this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining me, Marina, on the Marina Pro Podcast. But it's not about me. It is about our amazing guest this week. And you are in for a treat because Abby Rose is kind of my favorite kind of woman. She is a contradiction in terms. And I think we all are. Um, but I love that she owns her contradictions. So get a handle on this. She is an energy healer and a psychic and an accountant with an accountancy firm. <sighs> I think that's magical. I can't wait to dive into all of the things that she can teach us and especially just even that paradox that she gets to play in. So please get excited and welcome with me the beautiful Abby Rose. Abby, thank you so much for joining us today. What an introduction. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and I can't wait. Let's just dive straight in. Let's dive straight in. All right. First question though, because I just like to start with this one. Um, if there was an animal that most personified you, what animal would it be and why? I'm the dolphin. So one of my spirit animals is a dolphin um, and the dolphin's been with me for my whole life. And it's because it's the communication. So um, I feel that through my communication, I bring this kind of alchemy where it, it's like bridging two worlds that are seemingly separate just through my language, which is also a frequency. So sometimes I will speak and it's not even about the words. It's about the frequency that I'm holding. And I'm just here to share that in a nurturing way. So the dolphin's quite nurturing. So yeah. Who doesn't? Body- love a dolphin Abby I mean come on who doesn't love a dolphin so yes that's awesome and and then if you had a superpower what would it be if you could pick one I already have a superpower I was gonna say that I feel like you already do so why don't we dive into that then you tell us about the story of Abby and how you came to be this wonderful mix of these worlds with this wonderful message Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, So it started with adversity. Um, When I was younger, uh, adversity hit and I went into the cave back to my family um, to heal. And in that, I um, got a job in an accounting firm as a receptionist um, when I was like 19. And then that started this like real passion for business and numbers. And I went up the ranks and I started um, preparing BAS statements, um, working on primary production. There's a lot of beef cattle farmers, cane farmers up there. Um, and then I started my studies and I was just like accounting, I, accounting was my career. Um, and then I moved back to the big smoke and got into mid tier firms. And I always felt like I was a little bit different and you couldn't confine me to a cubicle. I wanted to be on the road with the clients in the meeting rooms, in the discussions, doing the planning. Um, providing a service to my clients where they felt loved or felt cared about. Um, That didn't sit well, I guess, with, um, and I just wanted it, like the cubicle, I couldn't be confined into the computer. It didn't sit well with me. So I decided to get out and I was like, I'm going to do it on my own. So I basic, I've been running my own business since 2009, started as a, as a bookkeeping business, and then it grew into uh, an accounting practice. Um, I literally rebuilt it from the ground up probably five times. Um, but it wasn't again until adversity hit and um, my, my marriage fell apart and my, it all just crumbled. Um, and I went on a sabbatical and I was like, I'm just going on eat, love, pray journey of self-discovery. Um, you know, get me out of business. I hate accounting. Da, 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 da. So I became a psychic and energy healer for two years and I did shamanic training and master Reiki and NLP hypnosis, all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it wasn't until 2019 that I just was getting really clear messages to you got to bring these two worlds together. Like they go together, they go together. Um, So ever since then, it's just been this wild ride. And 
been heavily endorsed by other professionals in the industry, um, associations, uh, and now I've got a team of accountants. We work together in providing um, the best service for the best people. So it's it's not about providing accounting services. It's about providing solutions to the conscious community so they can build wealth and, and make change. And I, I actually love that in reading, you know, your bio and what you're about, that you're about helping good people and particularly conscious enterprise do well in the world. Because I agree with you as an entrepreneur who trains entrepreneurs to launch into entrepreneurship because your soul is entrepreneurial um, often, right? But we may not identify as that yet. Um, I'm a big believer in imagine if all the people with the messages on their heart not only stepped into that place, but were successful there, then the world would be changed. So I love that. I, I want to come back to what that means. And I know you're, you, you really believe that um, accounting is emotional and, and that entrepreneurship is a shamanic journey. So I, want to, I definitely want to dive into that. But something you just said, which I think the listener might be like, um, what? You said that you, the marriage ended, can totally relate to that. What is it about your world falling apart that suddenly just puts us on a new path? I want to I first ask that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the universe will tickle you with a feather. If you don't listen, you'll get a brick. And if you don't listen, you'll hit by a semi-trailer. And most people wait for the semi-trailer. They don't listen. They don't listen to their own internal guidance system. They do things that is against what they believe or want. And then what happens is the universe will basically pull the rug from out, out from underneath you. Everything that doesn't align with your soul's calling and your true purpose will die. And in that, like literally, if you think about the regeneration of plants, you know, we had the bushfires, but what happens with that is new birth, new plants. It's how we keep regenerating. So in order to come to that place of birth and new life and new creation, you have to embrace the crumble and you have to let, let everything die. And I, I don't disagree. And I'm just going to dive in though, because um, I definitely waited for the semi-trailer, you know, much by the sounds <laughs> as you, um, it was like a, everything at once kind of thing. And, and up until that point, it looked like I was Miss Perfect with my perfect world and my perfect castle and all my box ticked, as I like to say, but really it was a perfection prison. But I just want to say on that, that when you say, when we're doing all the things that aren't aligned with our soul, it is our soul. And it's not necessarily the workings of our mind because our mind might think we're doing it right, but it is, it is a deeper awakening or an unconsciousness that's seeking to be spoken so you know particularly for those people out there listening if you're like oh but I'm really happy I thought I was really happy too and I'm sure you thought you were really happy for the most part too Abby right but if we're lucky enough and I say this a lot too if we're lucky enough then the universe will literally take from us that which we think we can't live without so that we can learn what really living is right 100%. I usually say to people is that um when the universe takes something away that we love or doesn't give us something that we want so bad, it's because what's waiting on the other side is far grander than we could ever imagine. I don't know if you've ever seen, when you said that, I thought of a meme and it is a Christian meme because it has Jesus in, in it, but it's, um, it just literally is a great picture of that. So if everyone can picture a little kid holding onto this tiny little raggedy teddy bear and, and Jesus is trying to take the teddy bear and behind his, his back, he's got this giant teddy bear, but yeah. the kid is holding onto this little teddy bear. So that that's, I agree with you hundred percent, you know, what's meant for you won't pass you by, but we have to let go of what we're afraid to lose to allow it in. Right. hundred percent. Now, so that I loved in your story and thank you for sharing your story. Um, the other thing I love that I'm thinking people would be like, um, pardon is you said, oh, well, so I just became a psychic and a healer. And I feel like that's not something you just like go in, you know, down to the local supermarket and pick up a couple hours in. So how did you suddenly become a psychic and a healer? Please explain. Yeah. So it started like I was on all sorts of medication. I was on any, any depressants, any anxiety. I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was on uppers, downers, blood pressure, sleeping. I was on all sorts, obviously with the downfall of my marriage and 
um, postnatal depression, all those things. And um, I just, I literally, I remember because I rang my best friend and one day I, it, I, and I said, I just feel like my whole life I've been asleep and I've literally just woken up and I've woken up from this slumber. And so um, my friend enrolled me into the NLP. And mm. at that point, it was just emotional stuff um, and releasing a lot of emotions. But what I found was it opened this whole other, um, whole other aspect of life of that I'd never even contemplated before. And through like a slow progression, um, well, actually not really. I literally got pushed off a cliff, let's yeah. be honest. Sometimes it can be super fast, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, boom. And it was like radio frequency on. And then I, then I just started, I was like, well, wow, this is something. So I've got to nurture that. So literally ever since, it, I would say it was the NLP. NLP is like the gateway to spirituality it can wake people up in an instant. And that's why I love it so much. I'm just, I'm going to jump in there because I don't know if you do know that through the School of Growth, we or I particularly facilitate a certification course for practitioners. And NLP is a major part of it, obviously, but we go even deeper into systemic work, family constellation work, timeline derivation and holographic. So we go, we go all the way because as you just pointed out, and I'm so glad you did, because I say to a lot of people, NLP is, phenomenal because 95 to 97 percent of our brain is in the unconscious realm and that's what's running our life and that's what NLP gives us the language and the tools to work with but then there's more because once you access the field you you there's so many things that you can pull into play that weren't available before and I think a lot of people do NLP which is phenomenal um, but to me it's the launch pad as you just described it in and then it's like well once we're in there what do we do so, um, yeah, I'm four modules in at the moment into our 2020 course and the magic is mind blowing. Yeah. And I agree with you hundred percent. Now I want to, I want to ask a question. I hope it's not too personal. Um, although I don't think you have those issues much like me, but, um, you said you're on a lot of things, you know, up as down as sleeping tablets, all the things was that prescribed by, yeah. So like medical doctor, pharma, yeah. And that was to manage. Yeah. To manage my mental health. Yeah. And then did you, after the NLP and when you said you were waking up, was that you coming off of those or how did, are you still on them? Like just so people. Actually, like I have, I don't talk about this very often. Um, it's funny it's come up, but um, I literally, after the NLP, it was probably two weeks, um, two weeks after the NLP, I had already woken up at that stage um, but I just, I, I even took a photo. I've probably got it like way back on my Insta somewhere of all of my scripts, wow. right? I had all these scripts and I literally just ripped them all off, all of them up. And I went cold Turkey because it was like, I, I could feel that something was trying to come up and emerge from me. And all of this stuff was just suppressing it and numbing me out. Mm. So I went off, um, you know, the blood pressure and the sleeping really easily. But when it came to like the antidepressants and any anxiety, um, yeah, I went cold turkey, which my mom, she's a nurse. And she was like, I couldn't tell her because she's like all for the farmers and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I don't advise anyone to yep. do it, yep. but for me, I knew my body and I was like, I can't take this stuff anymore. Yep. And I literally stopped and I've never, the only things I take now are like vitamins and, and multi, you know, the good stuff. Yeah. And, and to, I do want to just jump on here and say to anyone listening, Abby is not advising that you do that. We are not advising that you go cold turkey on any medications because there are you know, pathways and, and receptors waiting for certain information that if it doesn't come through, it's not that you need those drugs necessarily, but your system is used to them and the absence of it. I just caught a fly in my hand. I saw that. I just caught a fly in my hand. There's been a fly in this room that's <laughs> bothering me. And I literally just boss. <laughs> that's crazy. It's still in my hand. I'm not really sure. I'm deciding right now what to do with it. Um, I go my, um, my animal book and find out what the fly means. That is crazy. You you can do that while I basically um, remove this fly. Um, so actually I have a little container here. I'll sort it out. Uh, okay. So what I was going to say though is 
Um, but there was something calling you. And the one thing that I would love people to take from the message you just shared is not, oh, I need to get off all the things and, you know, I want to be like Abby, but rather that you, it is possible. Yeah. to come off these things and that they are potentially, you know, I, and I, this is actually what I'd love to dive into first off with you, Abby, is I have a thought occasionally that sometimes the people who get put on medications are actually struggling to process in a world that doesn't quite understand their powers or, or, you know, things beyond the, the spectrum that we're used to, when we can't understand it, we just medicate it, numb it and black it out. And, and I want to know for you, because we live in that world where people, I mean, honestly, I mean, if we're talking in mainstream, it's really common, common for them. If you were to say, oh, I'm a healer or I'm a psychic to get eye rolls. Do you, do you know what I mean? That wouldn't be uncommon in the general world. So how do you lean into that willingly knowing even parts of yourself you know with the background you've got might be resistant like was it just that you felt the call of your soul so strongly like what would you share with the listeners around how do we own our truth in a world that's often a little afraid of that oh, aspect of truth a hundred percent so in the beginning phases i was a i was closeted you know i wouldn't I wouldn't tell anyone. I wouldn't talk to anyone about it. It was just my own personal journey. And because I see the journey of ascension, of evolution, there's like kind of two journeys that people go on. Um, there's two kind of, which I talk about a lot. There's the, the overactive ego that um, the journey is to humble down. And there's the underactive ego whose journey is to stand in their power and we all kind of meet in the middle in this balanced harmonized you know world um so mine was really to learn to speak my truth and stand in my power and so I knew that I had to just keep it close to my heart until I felt I, I was unwavering and I because of the nature of my journey um and you know things important things along along the way um i had to relearn how to live i had to relearn who i even was i had to all the identities that i had attached to or i the person that i thought i was or you know just constant relearning so um there comes a time it's like self-worth is like a bank account Right? And when when you've gone through all these experiences in your life, you're in a negative balance. And it's not, you got to start putting deposits into that bank account, but it's like you don't go from a negative to a positive straight away. So when you're putting those deposits, it feels awkward and it feels weird. And it's like, oh, this doesn't feel right because you're going from a negative to a negative. Right? So of course it doesn't feel right. Mm. So if you keep going, keep going, keep going, put more deposits in, eventually you have a positive bank balance of self-worth, high self-esteem and confidence. This yeah. is massive. This yeah. is massive what you're sharing because, and, and just anyone listening, even if you don't associate to it around self-worth, this is the journey that I often hear people talk about, about, obviously, you know, in the growth space, helping people create change. So often we're looking at absolutes you know, like, well, if I had negative $10, I'm still not at positive $10. Mm -hmm. But as you just said, plus one, plus one, plus one, you might be at now negative five. Mm -hmm. And it's if we could notice the progress or the growth in the bank account rather than the, the absolute. And so some people will often say, but I'm still not there yet because you're not even at a break even yet, but that's because you started with such a deficit. I love that analogy so much, Abby. That's brilliant. Thank you. And being an accountant, I love numbers. Yeah, I know. I love that you used a bank account. Being an accountant, that's just perfect too. So I'm going back a little bit because I really loved what you just shared there around the ego and the humbling versus, yeah, break that down a little more because I know a lot of people listening um, and, and a lot of the clients that I have to work with or that I get to work with, want to work with, not have to, um, but the work we get to do is around you know, this imposter syndrome of who am I to be so magical and who, and, and even for myself, this has been a really big part of my journey. I have a lot of really, you know, valuable gifts. And sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe they don't want to hear it from me, or I don't want to come across too cocky or, you know, like humbleness was really revered in my family. And, um, 
And you're saying that you feel people have a almost like a dharma or a path into one of those two ways, or do you think it's possible? Right. Yeah. Can you share more on that? Because I found that really insightful that what you just shared. Yeah. So I feel like there's there's you've got the law of polarity, right? The positive and the negative. And this is where I talk about normally like. I will be able to tell based on when I kind of tap into people's energy where they're kind of at, you know, and we look at their soul purpose and their soul mission, but I see there's like two distinct journeys and one will kind of outweigh the other, right? It's not to say that one is good and one is bad. One is right. One is wrong. It's not. We're just, we're learning lessons. Our soul's learning these lessons that we've been learning for lifetimes. So some, for some of us that, um, you know, that lesson is that there's learning that there's more than just one person in the, this could be like nearly the term of the narcissist or that learning to humble down. There's more people in the world than just themselves. And they come back into a balance of, of contribution and, and um, humanitarian, you know, um, giving, right. And and on the, on the flip side, there's the polarity of that because usually in, in the dynamic, you've got the narcissist and the empath, mm. right? And no one is right or wrong. That's just the dynamic that's playing out. But each one is there to activate the other. So they meet in the middle, right? So that the empath is, is, needs to grow, grow an ego. They need to step into their power. They need to learn to speak their truth. They need to know that they're enough, mm. And, and the narcissist is there to activate. Now I'm using labels because that's what we can connect with, but you know, it's in a very non-judgmental and compassionate, right? Yeah. And this is just an aspect of anybody anyway. Yeah. yeah. Of course. So that the narcissist is there to activate the empath yeah. and the empath is there to activate the narcissist. So it's really be about being self-aware and seeing what those lessons are so that we can balance and harmonize. And even one of the biggest lessons I've learned for myself is that um, the one thing I never wanted to be seen as, the one thing that I never wanted to be identified as was a narcissist, right? So in my shadow work and the alchemy around that, I had to embrace the part of me that is a narcissist. Yeah and be okay and just be like you know what sometimes maybe I can be a bit of a bitch mm -hmm. but maybe she works for me in some areas and it's just knowing and it's being self-aware and then in other areas oh well where am I handing my power away where am I people pleasing so we all can be all yeah. parts so yeah. we've got we've got to see both sides of it in order to evolve yes I agree completely. And uh, particularly in the work I do around the whole womanhood concept that I teach, it's all about this parts awareness and the rejection yeah. of our parts is what we then, it's the trigger we see in another is the wronging that we, of the part within ourselves because they're now literally, you know, grandstanding what you've made wrong in yourself, which is why we get so triggered. So triggers are a great opportunity to, to access more of our parts to bring it all in because the more whole we are the less triggered we are by life which makes life a whole lot more fun and enjoyable so not that triggers can't be fun too but it's nice <laughs> to move through that work into some ease and grace so um i'm curious so uh, when you said you know the psychic abilities came through when you came off the meds and you unfolded and, and I, I can relate to that 100 percent. i was very in my masculine in my marriage and very locked down and so much of the world really opened to me when i opened to what I didn't know that I didn't know, right? Um, and when you say, you know, it became a frequency, which I agree, like there's so many frequencies. And But for people listening who have never really um, had that experience of audience or knowing, can you just describe when you're, when you're doing a psychic assessment with someone or, or a reading or whatever you would call it, you might be with someone and are you reading their energy field or are you just waiting for information dropping like just purely out of curiosity can you explain that to someone and what what someone might get from having a session like that with you um because some of them might be just curious yeah yep. um so basically i started it started off as a feeling in my gut 
right? And I'm, I read energy. So I, I work with energy. I read energy. I can read people's fields, see what's coming in, see what's present, see what's leaving. I love doing clearings through houses. I love, like, I love working, working with energy. So what it started as was just a feeling in my gut. So it was like, I just knew. I couldn't tell you how. I didn't know. I didn't have the answer. I just knew. But it's like your senses. When you start, um, when you kind of are really good with one sense, you can move on to the next. So once I really trusted that inner knowing, it was. It, I then started to hear as well. Now, spirit works in a very specific way. So you, you can't just sit there and go, send me a sign. Like spirit doesn't work like that. You've got to be very particular. And spirit will speak in your language, not my language, not Joe Blow down the street, your language. So how your imagination works and how your inner work, how you interpret things is how spirit will speak to you because they're your messages. Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading for someone else, I'll be interpreting spirit's language through, through my imagination. And usually I will hear, um, now I actually can see like Technicolor HD, I literally see whole things playing out and I'll just be like, okay. And when I'm looking at in the business world, I'll do sessions with people where we're setting up their structures and like even business structures are called entities. Yes, I know. Like the entity, so cool. I'll be like, okay, let's land this into the 3D and set it up. Um, so I'll see. And one time I even did a psychic reading and a, the woman had a cup and she took a drink from the cup and I tasted it. Mm. I was like, you're drinking a peppermint tea. And she's like, yeah, I am. I'm like, I know I can taste it. Looks like I can taste psychic as well. Oh, wow. And so for someone listening, and I know many, um, many people, particularly through, who have gone through the coaching course or some programs I offer, they start to awaken and they start to have these you know, moments of, whoa, you know, and I myself throughout my life have had many very powerful um, instances, but I, I would not say that I have, you know, the dial in, pick it up, like you can obviously have in the ways that you can. So for someone who is like, well, okay, if I don't go source, I'm ready, source, hit me up, source, let's go. What would you say? Is it the self-trust piece that's the most important? Like, thank you for that bit, bit of information, or is it just you know, maybe you're going to get it in this lifetime, or is there things that we can do to really nurture those gifts? Yeah, nurture it, nurture it. We, we all can dial in. Mm. There's no one that can't. I'm no more special than you. Like I, like this is, you know, a lot of people pedestal psychics and mediums thinking that they're like got this special superpower, but realistically the superpower is within you. So yeah, it's developing that trust, but also nurturing it and working on it. Like having that ability can be one of the greatest, um, you know, greatest, um, what would I say, like allies to have to help you, but it can also be to the biggest detriment because some information you just don't want to know. Some things you just don't want to know. And you're like, oh, why did I have to know that? <laughs> yeah. So then when we say nurture it, do you have any tangible tips for someone? Yeah. So um, I will do, I meditate every day, every day meditate, um, visualization. So I will um, I don't do guided meditation. I let my imagination go. So the more you can, you can cultivate your imagination and let it go rampant, um, like artwork as well, drawing and painting and coloring, just really, it's like tapping into your inner child. You know, the more you can tap into that creative wonder and just draw on that imagination, mm -hmm. Then you can, um, once you feel like ready, you can then set up, set yourself up in a space with intention and go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to get some answers. Mm. So I did that a lot. And I just, I'm just constantly, you know, uh, constantly, there's also, yeah, I need to, so the one thing that's very important when you're nurturing these these things, these energies is the protection. Mm. Um, 
for yourself, um, but also not to go and just go out and read everyone and just be like, I'm going to read you or, you know, I, I won't tap into anybody's energy without their permission, just because out of integrity, if someone asks me and I ask permission, yes, but it's not like I go around and I'm like reading everybody's energy and seeing like, I'd be so exhausted if I was doing that. I just, no. So I think protection for other people, be re respectful and protection for yourself too, because when you're being receptive to other energies, you're receptive to the good and the bad. So you yeah. gotta make sure you've got that protection for yourself. Yes. And um, I, I, I love what you're saying there. And I agree with you that no one is more special and these skills are available. We're just, we're just not in the muscular practice one of even knowing that we can have them or two using them so much like with so many things in life from what what i heard you say there is be in the practice of your creativity be in the practice of creation which is source energy inspiration and and um imagination which is idea 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 and then practice receiving asking questions and receiving and however it starts to come to you for me, kinesthetic and audience has always been the strongest. Um, but I think, you know, having worked with people, it, it comes in all ways, like you're saying. So just wait for it and then trust when it does that that is it. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing too, like I see a lot of people, they'll like, everything's a sign. Yes. You know? And yeah. it's like, dude, it's actually just not oh. a sign. <laughs> It's just a leaf. Yeah. It's just Four a leaf. Things. Yeah. 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 I, I love that actually. I love those memes that take the piss on the ultra, us ultra spiritual folk. It's very funny. Um, okay. So talking less spiritual, but equally perhaps as spiritual money and accounting, please explain to us how you have taken this psychic magical awareness and, and really, you know, how you do business different differently uh, and I would love us to dive into this topic about tax because I know you have some interesting thoughts about that, but I'm going to open it and you take us where you need to, but what's the key thing we first need to understand about money? Okay. Money is energy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I love it. Money is just energy. So, um, yeah, I, I basically will teach on all elements of money um, because of my accounting background. I've worked with business and with finance and money for my whole career. So I've kind of always had this like non-attachment. It's just numbers on a screen or numbers in a profit and loss, but it, they tell me a story. And when I can read that story, I can start helping people manage their finances a lot better and um, protect. So basically I help create, manage and protect people's money. Mm -hmm. And I can be looking at it from um, the 3D world, very structural, you know, logical kind of steps of how to manage your money or how to manage it in a more metaphysical way, like calling in more abundance, protecting your wealth. Um, so, there, sorry, Abby, can we pause there just for the listeners? And if you've listened to other podcasts of mine, we have covered it. But if this is perhaps the first one you're dialing into, when we say the 3D, we mean the plane that we live in where time is linear and we have 365 days to a year and I have a body and Abby has a body and there's dates and each date has 24 hours and we're kind of on this timeline. That's known as the third dimension or the three-dimensional world. When you said the metaphysical, can you just explain how that's a little different? Yeah, so there is no time space in, in the metaphysical. It's it's where you can access all timelines. It's where you can access all realities. It's where you can basically um, access energies and bring them into the 3D to help you. Um, I think that's, you know, yeah. to me, I just see it as like the void. Yes, and, and people may, if they're like, oh, that just sounds hippy trippy you actually already have an awareness of this and it's the kind of thing where you think of someone you're like oh i need to message them or i need to get back to them and then bing your phone rings and they've just messaged you so that's a thing where because thought has energy and frequency as well and it's essentially times collapse so it seems almost coincidental and i'm using my fingers for anyone who's not watching for the quotation marks um, on youtube but um yeah it seems like a coincidence or wow you know it's that stuff is is happening at a higher level and it keeps dropping in periodically but it sounds like what you're very masterful at is helping people 
rearrange time in the 5D and then bring it and foster into the 3D, which is ultimately what, you know, good change work facilitators are capable of doing. Yes. Yes. And I love that um, too, in the sense of collapsing the time in the 3D. So the, what, I, what I kind of see with the people that I work with is I'm not changing um, their sole purpose or their, their mission or their destiny. But by working with me, we, we're collapsing that time. Yes. So what would have taken them, you know, maybe a year, three years, five years, um, they work with me and we speed that up and it'll be yeah. three months, six months. Mm -hmm. So it's really jumping timelines and, and, and yeah, just. That oh. sounds just horrible to have what you want even faster. I mean, really, why would we want that? Um, no, that's awesome, Abby. So continue on um, with what you were saying. I didn't mean to interrupt your flow there, but I just thought that's a really relevant piece for people. Yeah. 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 So as an accountant, where was I even? Um, yeah. Have you got it? Accountant, money, 3D, 5D. 5D. Yeah. And then you were talking into businesses and yeah. yeah. So I help people create business because my passion, I'm a creator. One yeah. of the amazing tools that I use for a lot of my clients is the wealth dynamics. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I have, I've actually interviewed um, on an earlier podcast all about it and talking about oh, having, love it, love having it. it in your team and the creator and the mechanic. And yes, 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 yes. So I'm a creator, a star and a mechanic. So basically what, how that translates for me is as an accountant, I can come up with these really creative ways of making money and then saving money as well, because saving money is the same as making money. So, um, so what I that's like. Actually, pause there, because that's actually really big, what you just said. Saving money is the same as making money. Now you sound like my partner. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm always he's like but you don't need to spend the money and because if you don't spend it it's the same as making it because I'm really good at making money and he's really good at not spending money <laughs> but you guys are there to balance harmony yeah, yeah. Right? so he, you're you're there to show him that spending's okay because yeah. you've got to let the energy flow yeah what it but saving is also good and savings just as good as making money right if I like I um it was actually a little bit funny. Um, I was on a call with a client and um, there was two clients there because I got a referral and the internet cut out and they could, they didn't know that I could hear their conversation. Yeah. And yeah, one client was saying, oh, she's, she saved me like $30,000 in tax this year. Like, so like just, it's just as good as making money and yeah. like yeah, no, And like as an entrepreneur, for sure, like if I can get my expenses down, you know, like yeah. if I can minimize my expenses, saving five grand a month on outgoings is like making five grand a month. If you're looking at your plus minus equals equation, yeah. so I get it. But I just want that to land for people who are like, I need to earn more money. No. I need to earn more money or could you save some more of what you're earning? But yeah. yeah, on you go and I'll try yeah, to not really like, especially in the, in, in like the online world, because a lot of people will, um, are like they post about how much money they're making. They're like, oh, I made 200 K this year, or, oh, I'm making, you know, six figure months or, you know, all this. And, and I feel like, um, there's people who don't make that kind of money and they, they look at these posts and they feel like frightened or they're like, feel unworthy and they feel and, and it creates a bit of separation. Mm. What, I, what I like to say, I don't care what your sales are. I care what your bottom line is. I care what your net profit mm. margin is. Like, because that is where you pay the tax from, not from your sales, from your net profit. So you can have 200K of sales a month, mm. but if your bottom line is like 2% of mm. that, what's the point? Mm. So I just had one client um, who after three months, she went from 40K month to 150K month and increased her bottom line from five to 20%. Mm. So I'm like, that's huge. Well, that's, that's a win on both levels because what you've just three-folded her income and four-folded her, her ratio of what she keeps. So I think that's like what a, a hundred and whatever massive percent. <laughs> Yeah, so this is only this is only through the financial education that we can do things like this. Mm. 
this is where I get really passionate because it's like there's so much fear and there's so much avoidance and there's so much like I'll do it later or it doesn't matter or you know I can just make more money or I you know and I'm like let's look at those and unpack it so you're in a place of like equilibrium you're in a in balance you have no attachment but enough attachment to manage it yeah. and then when we're managing it we can tweak and then you're learning as well because i feel like sovereignty is when you're educated and then can make your own decisions if you're not educated you can't make the decisions how can you possibly know what decisions to make in your business if you don't know so yeah, not managing it or measuring it right you can't manage it isn't that how yeah, the expression goes yeah. yeah yeah so it's i'm about the financial education piece you know giving people the tools and the understandings to feel empowered by looking at their numbers and starting to track how things are going and learning to read it themselves so they're not relying on an accountant who let's face it doesn't return phone calls or you know like well, most it does but then you feel like you're now in debt beyond your eyeballs to your accountant who charges at a whatever rate per five minutes i know and and i can relate actually on a personal level a lot to what you're speaking into because you know um i have had the blessing of being in business for two decades now which you know speaks to the resilience but it would be a lie to say that every one of those years was super successful and you know really particularly right around the divorce was when I became very present to a massive black hole of mismanagement um, that I felt heavily responsible for for years to come I beat myself up about it for years um, because I, I wasn't looking at the numbers and I wasn't taking responsibility for them and things like tax weren't being paid appropriately and it, it nearly it nearly ended you know an entity that's been servicing thousands of people and generating you know um seven figures consistently and it's a it's really a happy little bubble that's been going on and on and on but through mismanagement and an unwillingness at then to look because it felt really scary almost nearly ended it so what you're saying is super important because entrepreneurs who are creators can come into the world and create and pull in all this money and then just through as you very um, eloquently just said through a lack of education um, not a lack of intention or not a lack of magic through a lack of education nearly lost it all or some have lost it all and then it feels hard and heavy this beautiful thing that they birthed so I think what you're talking about is so valuable um, that we all get the education around yeah and it's just for me it's just about finding that empowerment place mm. so many people come to me and they're fearful they're yep. fearful of the tax ban they're fearful of their obligations they don't know what things even mean and and it's like very few and far between there'll be entrepreneurs who who want the success but they're not willing to even look at what they have and i and i put it like when you reach the kind of success that say someone like yourself has you have to know that stuff you can't get to that level of success without knowing or paying you, you'll pay a price yeah at some point you'll pay a price if you're not if you're closing your eyes that pied pipe is following you along yeah that's what i'll say for sure and then then it, and it's ironic that it gets harder right it's like the friend you don't call back and then you're like, oh, I feel really bad. I didn't call them on day one. And then by day five, it feels a lot harder to call them to say, I'm really sorry I didn't call you. So, um, you know, it's one of those things, the sooner we look at it and every day we wait is another day that it will feel harder. So just do it. It's like eat the frog, right? Yeah, yeah. So then I guess that kind of leads into like the one thing that I say that kind of abolishes that fear which is like tax is not even compulsory. So let's unpack this because what? Yeah, so tax is not compulsory. We're led to believe that it is compulsory, um, but it's in my eyes, one of the biggest fraud in the history of mankind. Um, and we, you, you only have to pay tax if you have, you register, for an ABN or a TFN. But what they pump into us is that we have to have an ABN and we have to have a TFN. They make it very hard not to have it, but there are ways to have things set up so that you don't have it. So you get to, 
you know, be sovereign and self-govern. And, yes. and that's where I open the can of worm, <laughs> tax worms. Yeah. And listen, this is not a can of worms that I'm actually unfamiliar with, which is why I'm so keen to talk about this topic, because um, through the messes that I created through mismanagement, um, I was blessed in certain situations to have people describe to me much what you're describing, that there has been a fraud. And, and in a sense, it's a conditioning in our society around the concept even of the incorporated structure and the fact that, you know, even our names and our births being registered and, and all of these things have led us to, it's almost like because there's that wonderful story about the you know, the daughter who always chops the lamb in half at Christmas time. And, yes. and you know, why do I cut the lamb in half? And what, oh, you know, or the ham or the way, whatever it is that she cuts yes. in half. And she's like, oh, someone asked her. And she's like, well, I think maybe because it makes it more tender or I don't know. I just do it because my mom did it. And then they asked the mom and she's like, well, I don't know. I just did it because my mom did it. And then they asked the grandma, grandma, why do we cut the lamb in half or the ham in half? And she says, well, darling, because when I was young, the ovens were tiny. We had to cut it in half to fit it in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the point being there that so often we are assuming that what we're doing is for good reason or is the quote unquote rules. And we're so used to being conditioned into belonging and wanting to be good girls and good boys and not rock the boat that we don't actually stop and go, do I have to do this? Is this real? Um, and I'm certainly not across it like you are, but I'm very happy to have this conversation because as much as some people will immediately, one, because that's their reflex and we can lovingly hold space for that. That's not true. I pay tax. And I, I mean, I pay tax. Does that make sense? So I'm yeah. not saying that I am outside of the system in this capacity, but I'm very open to a conversation if you can share a little bit more with us. Yeah. And it's not like it, I don't go around going, you know, fuck the system and, you know, let's exit. And like, I'm not a massive like conspiracy theorist or anything, but when, when all this information came to me, I was like, well, what am I going to do with this? Mm. How, can I, how can I use this to benefit the people that I care about, the people that I work with? And, you know, what came to me is like, well, if the big companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, if they can do it and they do it and it's legal, why can't we? So I went on this massive journey of finding out what the law is, what, what we can do, what we can't do, how it all works and how, like, there's, there's two elements to it. It's having the structure, which is fine, but then it's like how to navigate the money going in and going out. So it's all within the confines. So you can sleep at night. So you haven't got the tax man knocking on your door because I don't do anything illegal, yeah. never. Um, but what I do do is use the system to create solutions that work to the benefit. So like you think, who's our, um, who's our prime minister? What's it? Well, who's our prime I don't even know. Who's our prime minister? Is it? Scott, um, oh, Scott, Morrison, right? yes. Scott Morrison, right? You think about Scott Morrison. He's a politician and he gets like $500,000 a year to be an Australian politician. Um, what Scott has is a, um, a private foundation called the Scott Morrison Private Foundation. And what he does is he will like um, basically move $450,000 of his, his pay into that foundation. And then that's tax free. So what's left is 50,000 in his name, which he pays $10,000 of tax on. And then, and like, that's basic, a yeah. basic idea of how yeah. it kind of works, but yeah, totally open to, to those structures now and just wanting to push it for the conscious business. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing, isn't it, is that what we seem to have is there it seems to be an elite at the top that, that knows how the system works and therefore is quote unquote working it um, in ways that we might classify as corrupt, but are actually, as you say, permissible if you, it's kind of like if you don't know the rules of a game, even if it's monopoly, um, but you get the basics, you're likely going to lose that game like compared to someone who knows all the loopholes and all the, all the sneaky little, you know, double down tricks. And, you know, we see, like you said, I mean, the most successful entrepreneurs out there have had failed businesses that have done whatever they've done and they've taken those learnings and those lessons and they've moved on. But I, I want to actually ask a question because I know this will come up 
um, and it, it's come up within me um, on a bigger level. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I understand as a as an employee of my own organization, I pay tax, and as a as an entity, my corporations pay tax, um, and they pay super, and they pay all the things, um, and GST. Like I'm a I'm a collector for the government as well. So um, my question is this. If everyone applied these rules and we all paid less tax, you know, because this is where we can go with this thought, how will our society function around particularly the things that tax pays for? Roads and schools and updates of things. Like some people would say, well, if you want to use the roads and if you want to send your kids to public schools and if you want these things in place and you're prepared to use them, then how dare you not pay for them? Mm -hmm. You know, like what would you say to that kind of argument around not paying tax or minimizing your tax because you're not saying don't pay tax you're saying minimize your tax in legal ways right so i'm about balance i'm about um distributing the wealth across the economy um evenly and at the moment it's the middle class income earner entrepreneur who pays through the teeth tax um and i feel it what should be like I don't know I don't have the answers mm. but what I see is like even distribution of wealth and so there is no upper middle lower class and if the I, I, I believe companies should pay taxes like big public companies they should pay the taxes so mm. the little guy pays less mm. right? but it's the other way around it's yeah. like it is the other way around tax. And then little guys, it's like keeping, you keep people sick, scared and poor, then you can control them. Yes. So I, it's not that, that we're not paying tax. So those things can't be contributed to. Mm -hmm. I just feel that um, the, the big companies, yes, pay tax. Um, and the little guys that are trying to emerge, um, it be evenly distributed. You know, and what I would add to that, Abby, and I'd be curious as to your feelings around this, is the, I love what you said there, and I, especially around the COVID situation, I've been really noticing this, like, you know, the government employees or the, and, and I have so many amazing friends who are government employees at hospitals and stuff like that. So I'm not saying if you're a government employee, I'm not, I'm not saying that with any, I'm not tiring any realities, but I'm simply saying government employees have been pretty well okay in COVID and, um, and large businesses like Amazon and Google have profited and gone, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we've seen the cost happen is, is really in this entrepreneurial space of people who are outside the box or outside the system who go, well, instead of me being a good little student and working for the, the, the structure of, um, you know, the government, I'll go and create something new that doesn't exist yet. Um, and literally that's, I mean, that's what we've seen closures of. That's what we've seen hit. And yes, there've been support to those systems, but in the next six to two years, six months to two years, we're going to see the death of the greatest number of small businesses. And we're going to see the middle class affected with the economic fallout from property prices and the physical system, which is in my opinion, the intention of this entire shutdown that didn't need to happen, but that's my personal opinion. And we'll leave it at that for now. Um, but what you just said makes a lot of sense to me. But what I want to add is the irony is, is if those small to medium businesses who are run by entrepreneurs who think outside the box were left to make more money, they would employ, we would have a, a flourishing of creativity and energy and life force and flow in our communities that would really potentially make up for any lost dollars that are that are essentially keeping a lid on the, the growth and flourishing of those. Because small businesses are taxed unbelievably heavily um, and it is tricky for most of them to make really good money because most of them are trying to help people. So they're not actually charging what they're worth, ironically. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I know for myself, if my business could go to the next level financially, it wouldn't be so that I could get myself a pimping car. It would be so that I could set up a charity to help the thing that calls on my heart. Like I, I read your thing and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. You know, when good people make good money, we do good things with it because yeah. intention funnels everything. 
And really what we're seeing at the moment is this greed grab, you know, in the higher echelons who know all the secrets and, and keep them to themselves. And as you said, they're feeding fear down the line. They're feeding rules and restrictions down the line. And it's, it's, it's strangling off the magic that left to its own devices would probably find, I don't even know, as you say, we don't know the solutions, but better solutions. So what I've noticed as my role as an accountant is I have access to all these people and these entrepreneurs and these creators. And I see myself as like a bridge of bringing these people together to create these things. I've got, I've got one client who wants to turn strip clubs into temple spaces so people can learn about embodiment. You know, I've got one client that wants to create cooperative bookshops or um, resource libraries so people don't have to have one of everything for everything. You know, and it's like I see a more community-driven economy, right? And it's how like when when these entrepreneurs and these creators have the freedom to make those creations and the, and the resources to fund them, that's where the change is. That's where the change for our community, local community, our Australia, global, is going to happen, mm. right? And this is where I talk about, it's not about extra adding the system and saying, hey, you know, F you, that see you later. Mm. Like, like, you know what, that doesn't work. But what we're going to do is go over here and we're going to actually create something that we feel would mm. work. You know, every second woman that I that I speak to is passionate about children and wants yeah. to bring create a school and create, you know, so there's all these all these ideas that are floating around. The only thing is we don't have the monetary resources mm. to like imagine if it was untapped and we could just be in that space of creation no matter mm. what. Mm. It's, it's literally yeah, imagine if people who had that magic to deliver could even deliver it in a way that just they could meet their needs you know what i mean financially and and maybe they're not out to be unbelievably wealthy or seven figures or eight figures or anything like that they just want to be able to put food on the table live a good life maybe if they like it's like where's the where's the inversion of the tax for the magic they get to bring like why don't we go look at the good you do here's your you know almost like our um, our carbon tax, it's like the opposite of that. Well, you just offset all the shit in the world so you don't have to pay tax just by doing something good, like a goodwill inversion. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. I think if we started to approach things like that, you know, and it, it, then it stems into so many things. You know, the way we get energy is just, it's all, there's such a greed and a control mechanism at the moment around money. And I think it's got to change, but that's perhaps a bigger conversation point than what we're looking at today. So, if someone is listening, and, and if you're listening and you're not an entrepreneur, but you earn money, what I would love you to take from what Abby's just shared is really sit in the space of just because I've been told it's so, what's really true or what's, what's possibly true? And if I wanted it to be different, how could it be different? And who might I need to ask about that? And what could I seek out? So it's like just taking the blinkers or the, the blind kind of holding of that rope and being pulled along in life letting that go for a second and just seeing what's available to you. Um, and if you're an entrepreneur, obviously, you know, reach out to Abby because she has these tools and resources. And if someone is an income earner through a salary, are there also clever structures that they can construct to help them build more wealth or protect more of their money? Because I know you said you help them, you know, create money. I think you said magnify or something, manage, but manage, manage. And then you said protect. So yeah, like, is it only the entrepreneurs who can benefit from creative um, spiritual accounting or is it, you know, income earners? How long is a piece of string? Everyone's situation is different. And it's usually when I, I ask a certain series of questions and then I kind of tap in and then I have a look at what their soul's here to do and all sorts of different little um, things. And then, yeah, I can like, this is where, you know, the creator in me, I can, some of the things that I've created in, in the, you know, structural accounting setup um, structures and ideas, you know, it's all legal, but it's creative. I just, yeah. it's always been creative accounting, creative accounting. So um, just because you're employed doesn't rule you out. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, my dad has, has let me help him and because he receives employment, he, he works for the government as well. So, um, yeah, like it's not that you have to let go of those jobs, but it's just thinking outside of the box. Yeah. And even that entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial mindset around, well, this is what I'm bringing in, but essentially that's my turnover. So what can I do with that? Right. Um, and it sounds to me, but please correct me. Would you say the number one place to start around potentially saving money or creating more money, even with what we've got without creating another new dollar mm -hmm. is structure? Is that what you're saying? Potentially structures or what, if you were going to give tips to start with or things to look at, what would be your top three tips for creating more abundance? Creating more abundance. Well, I look at it as, so I have the trilogy. It's like the trilogy of success, which is mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So if you're wanting to create more abundance, you would look at your, your mindset. You would look at the thought patterns and assess those. You would look at the embodiment place. So that's the behavior, the action. What are you doing? Um, are you looking at your bank accounts? Are you monitoring it? Do you have a budget? Are you like just frivolously spending or are you hoarding money? Um, so looking at the behavior and then spirit. So that's your frequency. So what, what are your emotions? How are you regulating your emotions? Where are you, where are you like vibrating at on the scale? And then just basically looking at going, lift it up. Lift yeah. It up. Let's lift it all up. Yeah. And I, I know, you know, you're, um, and I'm so glad that you are a guest at our growth gathering around money um, this month. Um, and we're going to unpack a lot of that there, but it's true, isn't it, that there is definitely the mindset, well, the behavior is obvious, but particularly mindset and the frequency. Um, this is, you know, why certain people, it's like, well, they have tons of money. They're not necessarily, they're not better people. Do you know what I mean? They're not necessarily gooder, great grammar, but you get my point, people. But there are people in the world who have a lot of money and they just have a lot of money. It comes in, they earn lots of money. They have lots of things. There's this abundance frequency about them and their relationship with money because they also, there's an assumption it's going to be there because perhaps in their family system, you know, which is the area um, that I kind of come from around this is, is abundant. Whereas other people are not battling, but have an opportunity to, to be with and then overcome different realities where maybe they think they can't have it or it's not available or it's got a harder frequency. But as you said, money is just energy. It's willing to go to anyone, but yeah, people no have judgment. Yeah. Like it yeah. will go anyone doesn't matter if you're good or good or inverted commas good or bad person yeah. money will go where path of least resistance so yes. let's just make it as least resistant as possible <laughs> boom the path of least resistance yeah i love that so okay well then um how are people making it hard for money to come to them they're making it hard because they they pedestal it, they pedestal money, they put power to it, they say money is the root of all evil, they, they fear it, they, you know, where money doesn't change who you are, you change who you are. Money is going to come to you, like I said, no judgment, whether you're good or bad, it, money just amplifies who you already are right? So if you want more money to come to you, you want to make it easy for the money to come. So we look at, we look at like what your thought patterns are to allow that money to come in and your behavior, because your behavior is going to be attached to those thought patterns, which mm -hmm. is also creating the emotion attached mm. to the frequency. So in the only way to change the behavior is to understand the emotion and the frequency and, and the thought process. So yeah, it's if you want it to, to, it's like you're a pipe, right? And all these blocks and things, yeah. whether it's behavior, whether it's emotion, whether it's energy, like all that, it's all clogging up your pipes, it's right? Yeah. Pipes are clogged, that money can't flow through you, uh -huh. right? So when people come to me, it's like we unclog the pipes. And I do that through, you know, the seven, my, I've got a seven step transformational process, which, you know, is mostly about the behavior and changing the behavior. Mm -hmm. We can't do that, you know, and it's, um, you know, awareness, understanding, surrender, transformation, education, embodiment, and alchemy, right? Mm -hmm. We go through that whole process through mind, body, and spirit to upgrade the frequency of their wealth. So people attract more money. And mm -hmm. like 
not everyone here is meant to be like a seven figure earner. So what happens is people come to me and they think they want more money. They'll either step into the life where they start receiving the money that they were always destined to have because they knew deep down, or they come to this place of complete and utter fulfillment with what they have. And they no longer desire to have all these mm. material monetary things. So yeah. You know, it's, it's so our, yeah, our mindset, our behavior and our frequency is blocking it. I love that. Yeah. Um, and then on behavior, um, yeah. when you said, are they looking at their accounts and like, what are the, what are the, what are your top three tips around behavior that healthy, you know, that would help declog any pipes around getting the flow of money coming in? What would you suggest people if they're not yet doing that they start doing? Yeah. So avoidance is the biggest one. Avoidance is the biggest one. So you've got to stop. You've got to stop avoiding it. And it doesn't matter if you earn $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year or $100 million a year. You know, if you want to make more money, you've got to have, you got, you can't avoid it. It's not going to come to you if you're not looking at it. Mm. If you want to make more, mm. then got to you're obviously hitting a ceiling so you want to break the ceiling and start making more so there's got to be some things you're not looking at so you know really getting comfortable and being okay with where you're at so that you can look at it and hold yourself with like no judgment no judgment there is no space for judgment there's no like judgment is the killer of success, right? So don't avoid, don't judge, hold yourself compassionate so you can see where you're, where you are and then you can plan where you want to be. And then all you've got to do is get the strategy to get there. I think that's super valuable. Um, I, I agree with you around the avoidance point. And, and really, if someone knows they're in that pattern from Sorry. down to it would be that's fine it would be really helpful for them to get someone to support them it's okay to ask for help and have someone hold your hand because what we can experience and survive we can repeat that's how you know behavior happens right and change and i love what you said earlier about um when people pedestalize money just for people who may be like what isn't money shouldn't we think it's good but potentially to break that down for people if they've made money mean something about them and made it mean that if they have more than this will happen and they have some kind of either systemic or belief structure that says that's not true like if i have money i'll be um, a successful person but somewhere down here it's like but i'm not a successful person well then you'll essentially keep from yourself the money so that you can be right about the belief that you're you know, not successful, which is why I can't recommend enough that if you have money stuff, as Abby is suggesting, go and look at your belief structures, go and look at your mindset around this, your behaviors, and then the frequency. Um, it's like, it's cultivating that relationship with money. That's the biggest thing because mm. our biggest lessons um, come from relationship mm. with our partners, relationship with our family. Mm is no different and I usually say like how you are in relationship is how you are in business and money you can't you can't be doing one thing one way and then yeah. another thing another way that's in awesome I mean I say that a lot too that the way we are in small ways is the way we are in all ways or the way we do one thing is the way we do all things but I love what you just said about money and relationship because yeah. That's something we often keep very separate. But if you're someone who clings really tight to friendships, maybe you're clinging really tight to your money, right? That's kind of what you're saying. Um, that's awesome. That's yeah. really valuable. And I also agree with what you're saying around looking at it because what we focus on expands. But this is where the mindset is important, right? Because if you're focusing on your money problems, well, you know, it's how you relate to the money or to the situation. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. All right. So as we start to wrap up, um, with you've just dropped so much wisdom today. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you feel called to share that maybe we haven't touched on? <sighs> yeah, so like what I'm getting you know, what I'm really getting is like, 
Like we're all on the growth journey. Like if you're listening or watching this right now, you're on the growth journey. You're on it, right? And whether you've got a business, whether you don't have a business, whether you've got money or whether you don't have money, it doesn't matter because your journey is going to be your journey anyway. And there is no wrong or right way to do it. Just we're all just trying to do the best we can with what we have. So yeah, I just want to leave people feeling really empowered that maybe they've just got one little thing or a few little things that that they can now take for themselves, whether it's around psychic abilities or whether it's around financial management, it doesn't matter. Just that one little thing so they can go out into their into their life and into their relationships and just feel a little bit more empowered by what's around them. Yeah, one of the things that if I reflect on our conversation today, and you know, we did, we talked about psychic powers, and we talked about money and tax, um, Mm -hmm. and how fantastic that we went that whole spectrum. But the message that I feel was really relevant in both is be open to the awareness that there's more than you currently know in all spaces, whether it's, you know, sex, or whether it's food, like there is more than you know. And it actually, I had this conversation with a client at work this morning, and I literally said to him, you know, life really unfolds in the, what we don't know that we don't know space. So Mm -hmm. if you can really kind of go, all right, well, yeah, I'm a, I feel a little stuck in this area. Well, the reason you feel stuck is because your pipe, as Abby just said, it's got some debris. Don't fight that. Get curious about it and get excited about the fact that the fact that you're stuck when you know that this is an infinite universe and you are an abundant, magical, powerful being, well, you get to go and play in that space. So open yourself, open yourself to the fact that there is a different way. Don't get stuck in the, oh, I must be doing something wrong because it's not showing up. Yeah, find that new way. I love that, Abby. And if you were going to put a message in a bottle that went to everyone on the planet, or it's a little earwig that they get to hear from you, and it's the only thing they'll, if no, if the rest of this podcast got deleted, but Abby got to deliver, hey, team, this is kind of super important. Just know this. You are enough. Hmm. You are enough. Mm -hmm. We're all enough. Yes. Imagine if everyone really embodied that as a truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just even that alone, I think. Yeah, just the recognition of enoughness. Mm. Oh. Mm. I really hope we get to live to see that day. Mm. Wouldn't it be a magical world? Yeah. Be a magical world. Um, you know what? I just, I don't know why this popped to mind. And I know technically we would be wrapping up the podcast, but you had something in your bio that you sent to me. And, and I don't know if this can be answered in a really succinct way, but you said, I feel like the entrepreneurial journey is a shamanic journey. Yes. Could you just touch on that really quickly? Because that was something that I wanted to talk to you about. And um, it's just yeah. slipped my mind until now. Yeah. Yeah. So a shamanic journey for me, for me, is, is it's about guidance and it's about um, death and rebirth, Mm. right? And especially over COVID, um, when you're, when you're in business, it's a constant letting go of identities of who you were and embodying new um you know processes systems staff marketing department hr department um you know it's it's constant growth and evolution right so i feel that you know the the journey itself as an entrepreneur even before i was conscious or awake or spiritual you know it was still that evolution mm still constant death and rebirth Mm. so for me um being uh in business for such a long time one of the things i'm so comfortable with is change and death and and the more comfortable i am with it like the more willing to lose absolutely everything Mm. the more i gain yeah 
so so it becomes like this journey of just it doesn't even matter anymore it's beyond anything I can control and I could lose it all tomorrow that's fine I will build it all again the day after (laughs) yeah in a different and even better or more amazing way I think that that is unbelievably true and I know recently I had um, someone say to me, oh, you know, Marina, they went through a tough time in business and they said, but I remember your stories about, you know, all of your quote unquote failings. And this is the thing, like by the measure of the world, I'm a successful businesswoman, just due to the timing and all the, you know, the time I've been in business, the number of businesses, the numbers of the businesses, you know, the bottom lines. Yet in amongst all that, there is like a graveyard of ideas that didn't get there, brands that got buried, you know, um, business relationship that's turned sideways and and unfolded and betrayals and mistrust and all the things. And and you're so right um, in our willingness to be agile and just flow with the ebb and the flow, the death and the birth, the death and the birth, um, without attachment to any one thing. You know, I think for me, it's always been, I've always been prepared to try and fail than not try at all. That was always been my preference. I'd rather know that I stepped up to the plate and batted, even if that ball goes flying past. So there's um, only failure if you quit. Yeah, agreed. And on that note, boom, get in the game team. If you're listening, that's what I'd be saying. Get in the game and have a time of it because your life is short and your gifts are grand and the world needs them. So playful out. 100%. Abby, thank you so much for joining us today. This was super juicy. I've had a ball. Um, I will be definitely connecting with you. Um, I have a team of accountants, but I think I need another one. So um, why not? We'll do that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you you so much for having, having me here. It's been a pleasure.